Okay, so thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, again, uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very nice workshop. Um, as Ian already said, I'm going to talk about the GLASMA and how we simulate it in particular in three plus one dimensions. So that means including rapidity dependence. Okay, let me quickly give you the overview. Um, so first I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> the framework that we use, which is the color glass condensate on which all of this is based on. Then I'm going to talk about the GLASMA in two plus one dimensions, so the boost invariant GLASMA. And then I will introduce you to the way we simulate the GLASMA in three plus one dimensions, including the width of the nuclei, basically. And then um, at the end, I'm also going to quickly talk about our latest project, which uh, is about Jets in the class. Okay, so let's get started. Um, yeah, if you're interested in any of this, you can later on look at the slides. I have all my references in there. So let's actually start now. So um, we perform heavy ion collision experiments because we want to understand nuclear matter under extreme conditions. So the two basic examples are always the relativistic heavy ion collider at the BNL. Um, and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And if you collide two heavy ions at high energy, um, you will get something like the image shown here below. So this is from the ATLAS experiment. What you can see here uh, are lots and lots of particles that hit the detector after the collision and also the reconstructed trajectories of these particles. And so what do we do here? Well, in principle, we just simply count, right? So we count the number of produced particles. We want to understand, we, we measure the energy and momentum distributions of these particles. We can figure out what species they are. And from that data, you can compute other things. So uh, things like flow coefficients or correlations. And of course, the main goal is that all of these observations should be explainable using uh, the theory that we have. So what does the theory look like? Well. Um, it's actually uh, not just a single theory. So in principle, one would like to compute everything from QCD alone, but it's actually a chain of models and simulations shown here. So this is a slide you've basically seen already today. Um, so the idea is that uh, since we can't directly work with QCD most of the time, we have to make some approximations. And given the regime where these approximations are appropriate, you get different kinds of models, right? So on the leftmost, the collision starts with the CGC, so color glass condensate, and the GLASMA, which is described by Yang Mills theory. <clears throat> and then after some time, uh, the description actually changes to kinetic theory, for instance, given by the compost model, which basically takes care of isotropization, as we all already saw today. And then after the QGP has gotten roughly into equilibrium, you can describe it using relativistic viscous hydrodynamics shown here. And then if, if the, once the, the quark gluon plasma has expanded and cooled down, um, quarks and gluons again form hadrons, and then you again have a kinetic theory description and some final interactions before the complete freezer of the hadron gas. And so the way to, to view this maybe is that um, Apart from the model formulations that we have here, we want to put in all our knowledge about, about nuclei. So for instance, what we know from deep inelastic scattering. So that's the way we build CGC models, for instance. And also, of course, the properties of the QGP. So for instance, the collision integral, the drop and kinetic theory, viscosity coefficients, the equation of state, and so on. And the output of this chain of simulations should be, uh, should be observables that can be compared to uh, the experiment. So for instance, the particle multiplicities, flow coefficients, and so on. And in this talk, I'm, of course, only going to focus on the CGC and the GLASMA, so really the, the first instances of the collision and the collision itself. OK, so what's this color glass condensate? Well, it's, a, it's a, an effective theory for high energy QCD valid at weak coupling. So if you think about high energy nuclei, then from the viewpoint of the lab frame, uh, they appear as thin disks because they move so fast, right? So along the collisional axis, they are contracted due to special relativity. 
in their peers in disks. And also due to special relativity, the dynamics inside the nuclei are very heavily time dilated, so they're basically frozen from the viewpoint of the laboratory. And if you think about the partonic content of these nuclei, you can roughly separate the nucleus into two different groups. So you have the hard partons, so think of, for instance, the valence quark of the nucleus. Uh, these carry most of the momentum. And then there's also the soft partons. So these are mainly gluons, which um, well, this is a special thing for high energy nuclei, actually have a high occupation number. And combining weak coupling and high occupation number um, enables you to actually describe these mainly soft gluons as a near classical coherent state. So in the CGC, the split is actually made explicit by really approximating the quarks of hard partons as static classical color currents given by this current here, J mu. And since the soft gluons form a coherent state, you can describe it approximately by a classical color field, A mu. And the CGC then couples these two degrees of freedom together through the classical Young Mills equation given here. And this allows basically an effectively classical treatment of high energy nuclei. So what does the field theory look like for these high energy nuclei? Well, assume we have a nucleus moving along the collision axis, Z, at very high speed. So that's just approximated as the speed of light. Then we can describe the color current of the nucleus by just a single component using light cone coordinates. So this is this J plus component. So it moves along the X plus direction here. And it only depends on X minus. So this is this width given here. And uh, the transverse coordinate XT, which you can see in the Minkowski diagram here, there, of course. Since they're static, uh, due to their dynamics being frozen, you can leave out the X plus dependency here. And now, if you want to compute the soft gluons from this color current, we simply have to solve the Young-Mills equation. Um, as a technical um, detail, we actually have to, it's, it's the easiest way to solve these is in covariant gauge for this specific um, situation. If you do that, then you will actually see that your Young-Mills equations, which are, of course, very complicated, nonlinear, actually just reduced to a two-dimensional Poisson equation given here. So you also have, if you just have a J plus component, then you also end up just with an A plus component of HV. What you can then do, at least formally, of course, is solve this 2D Poisson equation, for instance, using uh, uh, Fourier transformations. And at this point, it's, it's traditional to include an infrared regulator here because you don't always know what exactly the zero mode is supposed to do here or the low modes here in the very transform of the charge density. So it uh, makes sense to regulate this with an additional regulator that you can then also play around with. Okay, so this was the nucleus moving along the positive Z axis. You can do exactly the same with the nucleus moving in the opposite direction. Um, things change just a little bit. so. It's now just a J minus component, which only depends on X plus. Again, you just get an A minus component here and you can solve it exactly the same way. Okay, so this is basically how you get uh, your single nucleus solutions in yang mills theory. But of course, we haven't really talked about these classical color currents. I just assumed that they are given. And in the CGC, they're actually treated as random fields. So that means uh, you have some probability functional according to which they're distributed. And if you want to compute observables, then you have to integrate over these probability functionals like this. But the CGC itself doesn't actually give you these probability functionals. Uh, so this is where the modeling aspect comes in. So for instance, if here you have to basically specify what a nucleus should look like. Uh, and then if you know it, then you can of course perform all kinds of functional integrations here. The, the main difference to standard Q of D of course here is this, this is really a probability functional. So these are all uh, well-defined functional integrations basically. A simple example and also one of the earliest models for these CGC models is the McLaren-Gopala model. 
which is basically just a Gaussian probability function I've given here, but can also look at it in terms of the one and two point functions. So one point function of the charge density here just vanishes, which tells you that the, the current uh, the nucleus overall is color neutral. And the two point function tells you something about the distribution of the color charge. So um, here it's just delta function. So it's basically like white noise or colored noise completely uncorrelated. And one thing that's usually left out here is that um, this model doesn't really have any notion of a finite radius in the transverse plane. So it's more like an infinite plane in the transverse uh, extent of color charge, right? And this makes sense if you're only interested in, for instance, central collisions of very large nuclei. Of course, you can't describe anything like of central collisions like that. But since it's so simple, right, it just has a few parameters, we're going to stick with it for this talk. Okay, so, so just to summarize this, uh, we saw we can get these gauge covariant, uh, covariant gauge solutions by just solving the 2D Poisson equation. Um, we can get these charge densities that enter here maybe from the McLaren Van Gopelin model. And now we're interested in collisions. So that means we actually want to solve the coupled equations so both currents enter the AMS equations. And we saw that it was pretty easy for just a, the single nuclei given a, an appropriate gauge choice, but for collisions, it's actually much more complicated. So this brings me to the, the first part, the Glasma in two plus one D. So we want to solve this collision scenario. Um, basically, you want to have these two currents collide and produce something and in the future light cone, the field that you find here, this is what's called the glass. Right? So this is it's what is produced from the collision of two color glass condensates. And to, to figure out this field, we need to solve the AMS equations. But there are now a, a, a number of problems. The, first of all, the fields themselves are non perturbatively large. So even though we're at weak coupling, we have high gluon occupation numbers. So the fields are actually large and you can't really do perturbation in the gauge fields themselves. Then the other thing is, the other question is like, how should we account for the recall of the nuclei maybe, right? So during the collision, they should lose energy. And so maybe they get deflected a little bit. And so this is what's shown here. And then generally, of course, there are no analytic solutions for the yang mus equations in general, right? Uh, especially not in this scenario for the forward light cone. So, we need some kind of approximations to make progress. And first approximation that we're going to do is the two plus one D glass. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, we make the assumption that there is no recoil at all, right? So the nuclei just stick to the light cone. They move along X plus and X minus. And then the second assumption is that we assume that the nuclei are very high energy. So we can assume them to be contracted to just an infinitesimal extent. And mathematically, this just means that you can factor out this X minus dependence and replace it by these delta functions here. So the currents are really only defined along the light cone. Then it makes sense um, to uh, introduce maybe other coordinates for, for the forward light cone, so proper time and rapidity, because um, th these two assumptions together basically tell you that um, your system is now boost invariant. So since everything is already moving at the speed of light and it's infinitesimally thin, right? We can apply boosts along boosts along the z-axis, nothing actually changes. So this also means that the field that is produced in the forward kind light cone can change uh, under boost. So that means it has to be rapidity dependent. And that's why it's called uh, two plus one D Glassman. So of course it's actually a three-dimensional thing, but uh, since it doesn't depend on rapidity, we can say it's effectively two plus one dimensional. Now, the next step is to insert these currents, so these delta-like currents into your yang mills equation and try to see if you can solve maybe just a fraction of the problem. And it turns out that you can actually determine the yang, yang mills fields at the boundary of the forward light cone. So that means basically at this red boundary here. So that's tau zero plus, so plus so coming from above, right? And there you actually know what the field should look like. And then, of course, the, the evolution in the forward light cone is still complicated, but it's 
no source free, right? Uh, so there are no currents on the right hand side here if you have these data like currents with no recall, right? So that means we only have to solve two plus one dimensional uh, source free Young Mills equations, which can be done. Uh, you do it numerically typically, but it's doable. And we do this using real time. That's a sketch theory, which I will also introduce in a sec. So just for the experts out there, so these initial conditions along the boundary of the light cone are given here. So these are these famous uh, class my initial conditions. And one thing I didn't tell you about, uh, so I only showed you these gauge covariant solutions, but there's one technical detail. You have to actually switch to the light cone gauge solutions, which are which you get from these Wilson lines, these light like Wilson lines here. But the main point is just um, these initial conditions do not depend on rapidity, right? So whenever you're using these initial conditions, you have used boost invariance at some point, right? Okay. So what does the glass now actually look like? So if you study these initial conditions a bit closely, so you maybe compute the field uh, strength tensor from these initial conditions, then you will see that initially all the fields will point in the z direction. So they are all longitudinal. And um, they're actually, they, they have the typical um, correlation length of QS inverse. So QS is this famous saturation momentum in the McLaren Manogopala model. It's given by G squared mu. Um, but what this means is basically that your initial gas model is just a collection of longitudinal flux, tube, flux tubes, both electric and magnetic. And if you then let this, uh, this plasma evolve, then these flux tubes start to expand in a transverse plane and they decay. So during this decay, which of course is governed by the Young Mills equations, as I told you, you generate also some transverse electric and magnetic fields. Until at some point where basically all of these four components, so these are the longitudinal magnetic, longitudinal electric, transverse magnetic, transverse, transverse electric energy density components until they basically meet up at the same value. Um, at this point, nothing really changes anymore. It just keeps going like that. And this is actually a free streaming state. So what does this mean? Well, uh, to make this more precise, we look at the energy momentum tensor, which is, of course, the main observable because it's a gauge invariant and is used to couple to kinetic theory and hydro and so on. And you can simply compute it from the field strength like this. If you perform this average over all of these charge densities, as I showed you earlier, um, <clears throat> then your energy momentum tensor will look like this in the glass and rest frame. So it becomes diagonal. And you only have to basically worry about three different components. So the energy density, the transverse pressure, and the longitudinal pressure. So for discussions here, I'm going to stick to these three components. But of course, if you do event by event simulations, actually all of team in can be important. So this is just a simplification for the discussion here. Well, if you look at these, right, you will see that there's a problem with Yang modes. And the, uh, the problem is that it doesn't ever isotropize, as Soren already told you. So initially, you have this very highly anisotropic state due to the, these aligned flux tubes, which create also a negative longitudinal pressure. So this is maximally anisotropic state. And then through the expansion and the decay of these flux tubes, <clears throat> these two pressure components actually start to move together, but they don't ever really meet up. They get stuck basically in this um, free streaming state where the longitudinal pressure vanishes. And this has been a problem for a long time. So usually um, in order to couple to hydro, where you, or even also for viscous hydro, you, can't really deal with these very large pressure anisotropies. Um, you would do something like Landau matching, so you would get to compute the energy density from the plasma and also the four velocity, and then reconstruct the hydro energy momentum tensor from that. That really, like that, immediately uh, makes a jump from this pressure anisotropy to an isotropized or more or less isotropized state, which of, of course is not really great from a theoretical standpoint. But this has been more or less solved now by the compost model. So here, this is a, um, a plot from them where you can really see that's a roughly smooth transition from this free streaming state to 
the, the hydros they use in compost. This is one problem with the glycemia, but you can say it's roughly solved, right? Uh, but the other problem, of course, in the boost invariant approximation is that it's boost invariant, which of course is not the reality. Um, observables, for instance, the charged uh, particle multiplicity shown here, here at RIC and here at uh, the LHC, um, they show rapidity dependence, right? Um, so for RIC, of course, these rapidity profiles uh, level up quicker with growing rapidity. And for the LHC, it's more flat, but still, clearly, these aren't completely flat, right? So this is actually a problem because um, the, the prediction from the CTC now or from Glasma is that it's boost invariant. And if you want then to have some uh, rapidity dependence, for instance, if you couple to this hydro uh, software music, then you would maybe put in like an overall rapidity profile or something like that, this on top. So it's kind of like an ad hoc thing that you introduce. But we would, of course, like to, to also have this rapidity of it dependence directly from the color glass condensate and the glass one. And uh, this brings me now to the second part of the talk, the glass mine 3 plus 1D, where we try to do this basically. So um, if we want to have the glass mine 3D, we go back to the drawing board, right? We look at the assumptions that we made earlier. And one of the assumptions that we like to keep because it allows us to still have these single nuclear solutions in EMLs is to still assume that the nuclei don't feel any recoil, um, but we will drop the assumptions that they are infinitesimally thin. So we want to keep this finite width, right? Because this finite width, this is related to the Lorentz contraction. And if they're not at infinite energies, the nuclei, then they also should have a finite width. And what this means is that we basically, at, at, in the first stage, we keep this x minus and x plus dependence here completely general. Maybe say that it's confined to some, some smaller region, but it's not infinitesimal. And then what, of course, changes is that, at least in this Minkowski diagram, uh, this uh, interaction region here has some finite extent. So also the, the time during which the nuclei can interact becomes finite. And since now this isn't a single point anymore, and you can now boost things, and the, of course, the widths will change when you boost along Z, then you don't have any boost invariance anymore. So the glasma inherently becomes three-dimensional. But now the problem is, of course, can we still get initial conditions like before? Um, can we work with these tau eta coordinates? The answer is, at least our approach was not really. We actually drop all of this. So we give up the description in the future light cone and just look at all of the diagram. Right? Um, so that means we actually switch to the lab frame coordinates t and z and solve the Yang Mills equations there directly, including the currents. So here, the difference is really that we have to now really include the currents. And why do we do this? Well, we know the initial conditions at some time slice before the collision, right? So we know the single nuclear solutions. And if the nuclei are uh, further apart before the collision, then you can just superimpose these two solutions and you still get a completely valid solution to the Yang Mills equation. So we have some analytic and initial conditions before the collision. And now the only thing that we need to do is to actually evolve the system along the lab frame time, so upwards like this. And we do this also with free time lattice gauge theory, but we also have to somehow account for these currents. And for that, we use the color, colored particle and cell method, which I will show you in a minute. So first, um, a quick refresher, maybe, what this real time lattice gauge theory. Well, lattice gauge theory in general is a gauge covariant discretization of Yang Mills theory on a lattice. So, this is really uh, at the heart of lattice QCD, for example. Um, what you do here is you give up the description of the gauge fields in terms of the color fields, A mu themselves, but you actually switch to these gauge links. So, these are the Wilson lines connecting lattice sites on a lattice. Um, you can also just view them, at least for small lattice spacing, as basically exponentiated gauge fields. The main thing that you can do now with these gauge links is you can look at small Wilson loops like that. So these are called plaquettes, the smallest ones that we can form on a lattice. If you do that, and 
go to small lattice spacing, then you see that this uh, small Wilson loop is actually related to the field strength tensor in this cell. And using that, you can actually discretize the Yang Mills equation. So since we know how to approximate F mu nu, basically we know how to approximate the Yang Mills action. And the simplest one looks like this. So this is the famous Wilson action, which is just made up of these plaquettes. So the smallest possible Wilson loops. And some properties. Well, first of all, it's accurate up to uh, the squared or uh, uh, a squared in the lattice spacing, right? It's also symmetric under space-time reversal, which is also a pretty nice uh, property to have. But most importantly, it's actually gauge invariant. So that means if you, uh, if you restrict your gauge transformation to be just defined on the lattice, then you can perform gauge transformations like this. And you will see that, that the whole action is actually invariant under these transformations. So you're able to really keep the most important symmetry of the theory even though you're working on a lattice, even though you are doing computer simulations. OK, so this is basically how it's done for, for lattice gauge theory. Um, if you want to do real-time lattice gauge theory, we'll do the same thing in Minkowski space and then vary this action uh, with respect to these gauge loops. And what this gives you uh, is a set of gauge covariant equations of motion, right? So these look like this, at least if you perform, if you go to a continuous time. Um, so what you have here is, again, the gauge links, right? And then we also use the electric fields, basically, as conjugate momenta to these gauge links in some sense. And these equations, you can readily solve on your computer. It's, it's not particularly hard to do that. Um, but as I said earlier, what we want to do now is we also want to include some currents here. Right? So we want to put in some external currents here. And if you do that and you want to retain gauge covariance, then these currents uh, need to be conserved in the non-abelian sense. So that's given here. So this is basically the continuity equation on the lattice in the non-abelian case. And if that is conserved, then you're also guaranteed to have a conserved Gauss constraint, which is, of course, uh, a property due to gauge invariance of the theory. So how does one now actually deal with these currents in a simulation? Well, this is this colored particle and cell method. So particle and cell, that's a numerical method that actually stems from plasma simulations, so electromagnetic plasmas. The main concept is basically that you want to uh, approximate your continuous charge density uh, with just a large number of uh, discrete charged particles, point-like particles. And if you do that, of course, you can simulate things like plasmas where you have lots of charged particles coupled to the field. Now, the colored particle and cell method is basically just a non abelian generalization. What happens here is that your charges here, your point like charges, actually can become time dependent. You really have these time dependent color charges. And doing this actually allows you to get the gauge covariant treatments of these color currents on the lattice. So, of course, now the question is, how do you actually do this? Well, you have these colored particles moving across the lattice, but you have the fields defined on the lattice, right? So you somehow have these two degrees of freedom, the particles and the fields on the lattice that seem to be a little bit incompatible at first. So for instance, if you want to, uh, if you want to, for instance, solve given some colored particles, these, uh, the, this 2D Poisson equation, how do you actually get the charge density on the lattice? Well, for that, you somehow have to interpolate the continuous particle positions to the lattice. So that means, so if you have some particle moving across the lattice and it's in between different lattice sites, then maybe you need to interpolate, for instance, the charge of this uh, particle a little bit here, a little bit here, not so much here, stuff like this. So you somehow have to connect, uh, you have to tell you have to really specify how to distribute these particle, these continuous positions across the lattice. And the same is true for the other way. So for instance, if you want to know what is uh, the force acting on this particle from the fields that are defined on the lattice, you also have to say, okay, maybe this force defined at this point acts the strongest and this should be 
the other ones shouldn't be uh, uh, weighted too much. Okay, so this is something that you just have to specify, and there's various ways of doing that. You can do it uh, like I've shown here, or you can maybe take even more lattice sites into account, but you can also do something very simple, with, which is read it, the nearest grid point interpolation. So this means that you simply always take into account only the nearest grid point. And uh, this means, for instance, the charge density, the charge is just interpolated to this lattice site, and the force always comes from the nearest grid point, like here. And if you do that, then you will see as the particle moves across the lattice over time, every time it basically changes the nearest grid point from one grid point to the next, you get uh, this color rotation with the gauge link connecting uh, the nearest grid points that just have changed. So this is a consequence of this charge conservation I showed you earlier. Okay, so this, these are all technical details that I can't go into too much detail. Sorry, but yeah. Um, okay, so I hope this gives you an idea how this color particle and cell method works. So that's how it works. And now we have to really think about how we actually want to model these, um, these nuclei. So before in the 2D glass movie, we had these delta-like currents. And now the simplest thing that we can do is to simply regularize these delta functions with some finite profile functions like here. So in our case, we actually just use uh, Gaussian profiles uh, with some with L. And of course, this with L should be related to the Lorentz contracted uh, uh, nuclear radius. So it's just Ra divided by the gamma factor. What this, of course, um, neglects is uh, that there could also be interesting uh, longitudinal structure in the nuclei. So basically what we do here is just to smear out the color charge density. But of course, actually more general uh, distribution would also be possible, right? So this factorization, does, it's, it's not the most general thing that you can do. But for the time, this is what we're going to stick to. So if we now put everything together and actually perform these uh, simulations, um, you get pictures like this. So this is the energy density of the plasma and the nuclei in one picture. So you can see here we have the nuclei that just collided. You can see that they have some finite width here, right? And then in between, you get this genuinely three-dimensional structure of the plasma. And with this 3D structure, of course, also comes some rapidity dependence. And this is the, the thing that we're now going to look at. So we go back to the main observable, so the energy momentum tensor. If you, again, perform averages over the, uh, all charge densities, then your T mu nu in the lab frame will look like this. So now, things, since you have things moving along the C direction, you also have some energy flux, right? some pointing vector along the longitudinal direction. So these are these components here. And if we, if we are interested in the rapidity dependence, <clears throat> then we actually want to go to the rest frame of the plasma. So that means we, we want to choose a frame where this energy flux vanishes, so where this T mu nu becomes diagonal again. And then from this diagonal T mu nu, we can look at the 0, 0 component. And this is the local rest frame energy density of the gas. And this is what we're really interested in. And then to, to actually look at the rapidity dependence, of course, we're going to parameterize it using uh, proper time and rapidity. So if we do that, we get um, results like this. So this shows um, the rapidity profile of the uh, energy density of the plasma as a function of rapidity evaluated at one Fermi over C in our simulations. You can see um, here in black, right, uh, for different values of this infrared regulator I introduced earlier, you get different widths. And of course, the width that is shown here also depends on the collisional energy, but that's not really shown here. What we can then do is to compare um, these results to the rapidity profiles of the actual experimental data, right? So uh, what you do is we look at the particle charge particle multiplicity from the Brahms experiment. So these are shown here. Uh, in blue, you also have the Gaussian fit to that. And you can see that this, for at least one set of parameters, this matches up nicely. So we can, at least in principle, reproduce uh, roughly this rapidity dependence. 
at least for Rick, it's also interesting to, to plot the lambda model because this also, at least up to Rick, roughly it gives similar results for the rapidity profiles. Okay, so this was the rapidity plan, so we can really, really get this. Now, the other thing, uh, the other problem we talked about, the pressure anisotropy that is uh, not solved by our approach. So let's take a look at this. So first at the left, so in, in black, you have the energy density of the plasma and the nuclei. In blue, you have the longitudinal pressure. And in red, scaled up, you have the transverse pressure of um, the glass. So what's, of course, different now here is, first of all, we can go beyond tau equals zero, right? Since we have access to the full, um, full Minkowski diagram, we can actually, our, our collisions start a little bit earlier uh, when the nuclei start to overlap. And what you also see is that um, at the beginning, uh, since we can't really separate the color fields of the nuclei and the fields of the plasma, the fields of the nuclei really dominate uh, our simulation. So only after these nuclei have moved further apart, we actually see what just the plasma is doing. And if we do that, so we switch again to the, these pressure divided by energy density fractions, then we will see, we see that basically we get the same result as the 2D plasma. The 2D plasma result is shown here in the, these dashed lines. So again, more or less the same anisotropic state. But of course, what we do have is we have access to the full space-time distribution, which in itself is already very interesting. So here I'm showing the transverse pressure, which is basically just made up of the longitudinal fields of the plasma. And you can see um, you really get the full structure. And what's just an interesting observation, completely qualitative, not quantitative, is that these distributions look very similar to other kinds of um, finite width collisions that one can perform, namely um, holographic collisions. So this is already pretty nice, but of course, no isotropization. Okay. Um, of course, what we did was pretty simple. So we didn't have any, fin any finite radius for our nuclei. Um, and also we have no longitudinal color fluctuations. Right? So we have this, um, we have uh, this um, factorization here. And the problem is, of course, that these 3D simulations are pretty expensive computationally. So you need high resolution for stability, but you also want to look at large simulations, so large volumes to get actually realistic results. And we've done some progress here to improve the situation. So here you can look up um, a semi-implicit method for our simulation to maybe reduce the computational um, demand a bit, but again, this is a pretty hard, it's, it's pretty hard to go beyond this. Okay, then I don't want to give the impression that we're the only ones working on this kind of uh, stuff. So other works on the 3D glasma in the sense that I'm talking about here, so rapidity dependence, and it was a nice paper by Schlichting and Schenke in 2016, where they got their rapidity dependence from the gym work evolution, which we did. Um, there, they didn't really do full 3D dynamics. It's more or less like stitched together 2D uh, plasmas, but it's still, you can nicely re reproduce some observables and you can also uh, go up to LHC energies, which we of course haven't done now. Then recently, the work by McDonald, John, Gale, um, again, rapidity dependence comes from Jim Oak equations. They have actually full 3D dynamics in the tau eta frame with coupling to hydrodynamics, they can go to LHC energy, so it's all great, but I would say their initial conditions are not really rigorous, so it's not really clear how you would come up with these. And just to compare so what we did, uh, our rapidity dependence does not come directly from the gym work equations, it comes from the finite width of the nuclei. We have full 3D dynamics in the TZ frame. Currently, we're only up to rig energies, but we have rigorous initial conditions, even though we just have um, uh, no longitudinal fractions yet. Okay, so, and um, in the last part, I quickly want to uh, show you some results from our latest project, uh, which is about jets and the plasma. So uh, all of this talk, I basically only talked about aspects of the energy momentum tensor, but one has to, of course, remember that it's not everything uh, that's interesting in heavy ion collisions. So uh, there's also, there are different observables like jets, so phenomena like jets, um, which show up in the detectors as highly energetic focused particle sprays. 
And these particle sprays actually come from initial hard scatterings during the collision. Oh, sorry. Um, so basically, you think of two hard quarks in the nuclear scattering and then uh, moving towards the detector. And as they move through the medium, they lose energy, the momentum is broadened. So you have some opening on this angle. And of course, they also decay into lots of other particles. And then you can actually measure them on the detector. What's interesting about these jets is that they actually go through all of the stages of the medium, including um, the initial uh, pre-equilibrium state. So the question is now, how do the strong color fields of the plasma um, actually affect these jets? And how does that, and that, of course, happens before the hydrodynamical stage where actually plus, uh, jet simulations usually take place. So and to, to summarize this in one, one picture maybe, what we're interested in now is uh, the glasma again, um, and a single jet just moving across uh, through this glasma, for instance, along X, and to see what happens to that jet. So that jet, you can imagine initially just being a single quark, and as it interacts with the glasma, um, of course, it gets accelerated to the side. So even if it has initially just a momentum along X, it will get some momentum along Z, and some momentum along y. And since, of course, we have to average over the glasma, this, it, the, the deflection depends on the exact color field here. So overall, you basically get this opening angle of this jet. And this is what we want to look at now. So as I said, we model a jet just as a single quark or a single gluon at the beginning. It moves with very high initial momentum. And that means that we assume that um, there's no deflection. So basically, the trajectory doesn't really change because momentum is so high. But what you can still do is, um, as it moves through the glasma, um, it, it, the, the Lorentz force, the color for uh, the non abelian Lorentz force of the glasma will affect the jet, uh, affect this quark. Um, and even if it doesn't change uh, its trajectory, it will accumulate some transverse momentum, so orthogonal to x. So I and Z, right? Over time. And we do this computation for simplicity in the 2D glasma because, again, 3D glasma is computationally very demanding, and the 2D glasma, at least now, isn't so much anymore. And what we basically want to do is we want to solve the Wong equations. So the Wong equations are just the non abelian generalization of the Lorentz force. So this first equation you should recognize it's basically just a non abelian generalization of the Lorentz force. And what's special, as I already told you earlier, is that, of course, the color charge of a particle can change over time, which it wouldn't in the abelian theory. And what we do now is basically want to integrate these equations, and we want to use the background field from uh, the glass. So we really treat it as a background field. So uh, the, as the gluon passes through the glass, uh, sorry, as the quark passes through the glass, it doesn't really affect the glass at all. Right? It's just a simple. This is at least the approximation that we do now. Well, if you do that, right? So if you actually integrate these equations and then you average over the color charge of the quark, you average over the background fields, then you get a result like this, um, <clears throat> which is actually quite understandable, right? So this is the average squared accumulated momentum along the axis i, so either y and z, and it's given by the double time integral over the force correlator, basically. And the force is just a non abelian generalization of the Lorentz force. So, non abelian here means really you have to take into account these color rotation matrices that come from the conservation of, uh, of color charge, right? David, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have three yeah. minutes more. Yes, I'm, I'm done then. In three minutes. Okay, so um, now we perform these simulations. And if you then think uh, about the glasma again, um, it's made up of these flux tubes, so electric ones and magnetic ones. And if you then now just use the right hand rule, right, you will see, okay, the electric flux tubes will accelerate the quark along Z, uh, the magnetic flux tubes will accelerate it in the transverse plane. And in principle, usually one thinks of the electric and magnetic content of the glasma as being roughly the same, but it turns out when it comes to the deflection of these uh, jets, it's actually pretty different because these flux tubes aren't actually created equally. So if you look at the correlation functions of the longitudinal fields, then they look quite different at the beginning. So you have some mostly positive correlation for the uh, electric field, 
But for the magnetic one, you actually have a large region of anti-correlation. That means basically in the simple picture, you get a ring of anti-correlation around the center of this flux tube. And that means that the um, acceleration along Z is much more efficient uh, compared to the transverse plane acceleration. And that means that the momentum broadening that we find is highly anisotropic. And this is then neatly summarized here. So um, to make some connections to phenomenology, we, uh, we uh, um, computed the momenta at tau 0 0.6 Fermi over C, so roughly where the jet simulation start. What we see is that the overall momentum is roughly QS that the quark accumulates. But it's anisotropic, so it, it's uh, the, the factor between Z and Y broadening is roughly 2. And what we also see is that there's some dependence on the infrared uh, regulator, um, which is interesting because um, that usually shouldn't be the case, but here we really see it. It has to do with these initial correlation functions that depend on the infrared regulator. And of course, you can do the same thing for gluonic jets if you just do this uh, Casimir scale. And then with these accumulated momentum, we can compute another interesting parameter, which is the jet broadening parameter. Uh, it's just given by the time derivative of the squared momenta and it's shown here. And what this really shows is the time dependence of the ac accumulation. So you can see that within the first 0 0.1 Fermi over C, the quark really gets all of its momentum and that's it. And it's, uh, of course, anisotropic. And this already brings me to the end. Um, so it would be interesting in the 3D glass minute to go to LHC energies, include longitudinal structure. And for jets, um, we only looked at momentum broadening, not energy loss. One could do full CPIC modeling of this if you want. And of course, chats would also be interesting in the 3D class. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this beautiful pedagogical and in very interesting talk. And we are now, we'll take questions. So first, let me read out the questions that are already put in the chat box. The first two questions are from Sweden and, uh, and they're technical actually. So the first question is, when you switch to from TZ coordinates to the tau eta, this proper time rapidity coordinates, uh, how do you define the origin of the coordinate system? Where, where do you put it in your, in your yeah. simulation? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, what we do to answer it quickly is to, we look at the, basically the maximum of the transverse pressure shown here and just choose that as the origin. So, there's of course different ways of doing this. Um, one way that's maybe hinted at by uh, these, these pictures I showed here is to just define it at the maximum overlap of the nuclei. But when we did this and looked at the rapidity profiles, we saw that the rapidity profiles start to depend a little bit on the, on the, on the um, proper time on which you evaluate them. I mean, this is in some sense natural that this would also depend on the proper time that you choose here. But then what I saw is that if you, if you move the origin slightly up, yeah, so to really uh, align with the maximum of the transverse pressure, which is purely generated from the glass, then suddenly these uh, rapidity profiles become very, very stable. And it doesn't really depend. If you don't go to too early times, then you basically always get the same result. That's, that's what we did in this specific uh, case. But of course, it's a good question because, um, yeah, it doesn't really tell you where to put it. You can, especially if you don't have nuclei that have hard borers, right? We have these Gaussian profiles, but even if you had like wood Saxon or something, still there's some fuzzy boundary. So you can't really easily uh, define a forward light cone and no origin. But this is what we did at least. So the second question by Soren is in this. Uh, particle in cell method, uh, charge particle in cell method, can you go beyond the time when the charges hit the edge of the... Okay, so basically what happens when the nuclei move towards the boundary here? Well, um, no. Um, what we have, um, because we have temporal gauge and so on, is we have some um, basically fixed boundary conditions here at the Z boundaries. And if the nuclei start to hit um, uh, the boundaries, we just remove these charge densities. And of course, this introduces some error. So every time you want to maybe compute things in, in the tau eta frame and you go to too high rapidity, then you start to enter into some regions where maybe the nuclei aren't even like, well, 
you shouldn't trust your results too much. So of course, the maximum time we can simulate this chiasma is definitely uh, uh, limited by the width of our, our box along Z, which is also a reason why it's so hard to do, or at least it's so computationally demanding, right? You can just, in the boost invariant case, and even if you do um, just tau eta coordinates, you can just have a grid and rapidity and tau, and it's fine. But here it's really limited, yeah. OK, then there is a question, actually two questions by Mike. Uh, so he refers to his older work in 2008 when he was in Frankfurt. And he was saying that he was able to original uh, charge particle and uh, cell work. He was able to extract the momentum broadening parameter Q hat and the energy loss DE by DX in static box by including both hard and soft scattering. Uh, so he also, with respect to the field too, the question is, uh, do you include hard pattern scattering in your way of doing things? And then the second question is, how do your results depend on the lattice spacing? Okay. So um, we, first of all, we do not have any hard scattering at all. The only thing that we do is basically solve the Wong equations with just the background field. So it's really a test particle approximation. So we don't have any other hard particles hitting the chat or something like that. Um, the second thing is, um, do our results depend on lattice spacing? Well, I hope not. I made a lot of simulations and, and tried to use as much memory as I had to go to higher and higher lattice spacing. And these results really don't, don't, don't really change with the lattice spacing anymore. Um, yeah, this is, this is what I can tell you about this. Okay, uh, so are there further uh, questions? Well, maybe one comment. Yeah, so, yeah that confuses me because we, we struggled hard to make sure that our energy loss and Q hat results didn't depend on the lattice spacing by having hard parts on scattering. I mean, we didn't introduce it because we wanted to. So I'm, I'm a bit confused about that. Okay, I mean, um, the thing is that, especially at a little bit later times, the glassman doesn't really depend so much on, on any UV cutoff anymore. Um, so there's this paper by Thomas Lappi from 2007, I think, where he showed that, I mean, that there's something like a UV divergence in the glassman tau equals zero, really, that's usually regulated by the lattice spacing, but at slightly later times already, it, it, it doesn't matter but, at all. I mean, the problem is, is, is not that. I think I mean, it's related to just simply the underlying process that you're looking at, which is just okay. uh, gluon exchange, right? Which is causing this scattering in the first place. And formally, you should always set, separate this into the soft sector, usually in some Bratton, you know, Yuan kind of prescription and a hard sector. Um, and only when you put these two things together will you be in, independent of the separation scale. Um, and so in, in, in essence, you've only included the soft part of the, yes. uh, of the process. But the glasma initially is very soft, right? So if you only care about the first instances of the collision, the hard sector yeah, it's, isn't. Yeah, that it's possible important. that it doesn't matter in this case. I'm, I'm just. And also, I mean, as a technical answer, right? Um, it just turns out that um, for the MV model, the way we used it, if you regulate with this infrared regulator and so on, right? Then at some point, uh, if you increase your uh, lattice resolution, things don't really change so much anymore. So uh, just from the viewpoint of the jet, apparently the, the, the fields become continuous enough that things don't matter so much, right? We also did, by the way, we also um, did the same calculation in the dilute plasma. So that means mm -hmm. uh, where the, the color fields are very weak and we can actually do just uh, linearized yang mills, And we can do that on the paper, basically. And so mm -hmm. we also saw that our results there do not depend on any UV cutoff, which you may, maybe at first you want to be careful and introduce it, but then it doesn't actually really matter, at least also in the dilute case. Which is, which is a semi-analytic calculation, at least, except for some integrals at the end. Um, we see no real UV dependence. I mean, I was also a bit surprised uh, because mm -hmm. the, the initial energy density of the glasma can appear to be very UV, de UV dependent. Um, and of course, the chat also should feel the, the um, 
the first instances of the glasma. And then I thought, okay, maybe this will mean that we have some UV dependence. We will have to regulate it with mm -hmm. the regulator. But it just, I don't know. It, it seems to be not so sensitive to these modes. Actually, maybe and, I should uh, look at the dilute case again, where we also have some integrals. Over yeah, yeah, we, 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 we didn't look at the... We didn't look at the over occupation. So we were just setting up thermal configurations essentially and then shooting things. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I look. yeah. Um, okay. oh, one other question before I let you go and then I'll let other people get in. So you showed the rapidity dependence for RIC energies. Do you also have the plot for LHC energies? Yeah, um, yeah so uh, not yet. Uh, the reason is that um, <clears throat> uh, if you want to go to LHC energies, um, you have to make your nuclei basically by effect of 10 uh, thinner, right? At the same time, yes. if you want to go to tau one fermi over C, you need a decently large uh, box, um, simulation box, I mean, to, to simulate this in. And so that means you need quite a uh, fine resolution, particularly along C, and that, that, yeah. that has been have a you, problem. Have, Just, have you considered going beyond the nearest grid uh, point approximation for the current smearing? Um, initially we did, but then our, our solution was actually to just use more mm. particles so that everything is smeared out enough. Right? So we have how many how many test particles, particles per cell. cell do you need? Yeah, yeah. But then, um, so this I haven't really talked about this, but I, I said that we have some uh, a new method to simulate everything, uh, not the standard leapfrog method, which is a semi-implicit method where I can. Mm -hmm. I take advantage of this, this magic time step where you set the time step of your simulation to the, in our case, lattice spacing along C uh, and get like nice properties like dispersion free propagation and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you really don't need any smearing anymore because basically in every, every step of the simulation takes one particle from one cell exactly to the next. So that's why currently we haven't really thought about going beyond the NGP scheme. Okay, thank you. So there's a question from Logan Igum. Uh, he's asking when you, when you are numerically solving classical angles, are you also including how difficult is it to include stochastic sources? I think you're already doing that, right? And are there simulations of this type? Stochastic sources, okay. Um, no, I mean, and it depends on what you mean. So one thing I can think of is, um, or maybe maybe the person wants to say something. So I don't answer the uh, different so, question. Yeah, Look, you so, can ask. yeah, so, uh, hello. so I, I, I was thinking of stochastic sources are really from the light cone. Uh, so I, I know you're including uh, stochastic sources on the light cone uh, to model the nuclei, but, but, but just uh, I'm asking, in just, just a pure animus, animus a classical approximation uh, to the, you know, you can take a point of view and approximating by a classical animus So just uh, fluctuations in the number of gluons, that kind of uh, stochasticity, uh, do you take into account some way? Uh, so that was the thrust of my question. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you're talking about fluctuations on top of the fields here, in addition yeah. to what we already have. Yeah. I mean, um, we haven't done this. Uh, we, of course, haven't done this. But in principle, I mean, as long as you are able to satisfy uh, gauge covariance, so that means if you do all your current rotations of your currents correctly and so on, then in principle, I guess one could also put something on top of that. But I'm, I, I have never thought about this, to be honest. I mean, there's, no, I, <laughs> I don't want to give a wrong answer. So no, not really, haven't uh, considered this. But in general, we, I mean, this, this, our software, our code just solves the yang Mu's equation in, in general, basically, with some current. So I guess technically there's no issue here. OK, thanks. Okay, so uh, we have only time for two quick questions at the end now, two or three, when one is from Shantan, how can one include longitudinal color fluctuations in this framework? Or does it require a completely new framework? No, 
uh, it doesn't require anything in principle. So if, if, if our code were super stable and could handle any kind of like uh, fluctuations along C without going numerically unstable, then of course everything would work. But the reality is that basically um, the way I view it is um, if you have like these fluctuations in this very thin nucleus already, right? Then from the viewpoint of the fields, you have like lots of UV modes. And the lattice approximation is of course uh, worse for the ultraviolet modes compared to um, the infrared one. So you want your things usually to be very continuous as, con as smooth as possible in the lattice to get results that are actually like meaningful and that really solve your young Mose equations and not just some discretized thing that's different from that. So in principle, if you could just increase the lattice resolution along C uh, further and further, like you have some super, super computers and, and, and do your simulations there, then you could uh, definitely just put any kinds of fluctuations in there. Of course, I mean, there's always a limit, right? Your lattice resolution will always be a limit, but in principle, there's nothing stopping us from, from doing these kinds of simulations except the numerics. <laughs> Uh, and, and computational power, and also that we just worked on other things in the meantime, of course. Uh, but I think, uh, so what, what I teased at here, um, uh, this, this extension, wait, where was it? Yeah, yeah. so the, the semi-implicit methods kind of solve some of these problems. So you can effectively get a better simulation without going to a higher lattice resolution. And, and this, this if, if we continue with this, uh, hopefully then this should be the way forward at least for our approach. Okay, so Soren would have a question that he would like to ask himself. Yeah, um, hi David. So um, what I was wondering is actually, so, so you presented lastly this framework to do the simulations and so forth, right? And you also said the difficulties of including all these longitudinal fluctuations. Now, what I was wondering is whether there's any, um, any analytic calculations actually say in the dilute limit of this to, to really get a better handle of, uh, you know, I mean, how does the, how do the longitudinal color fluctuations actually influence the rapidity profiles? You know, how do we, how can we roughly understand the rapidity profiles that you get? Are you aware of anything like this or have you done something like this? No, I mean, what I, of course, for my PhD always tried to is, is to get some glass initial conditions the forward light cone that has have some rapidity dependence, even just with some approximations, but I never really made any progress there. Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything. Um, of course, one could, I guess one could do it in the dilute case. Because in the dilute limit, it should be solvable, right? I mean, it should, yes, it would yeah, be interesting to just understand, you know, somehow at a basic level, what is, you know, what is generating these profiles and why do they look why the way they look, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. Maybe in the dilute case, one could make some progress there. Yeah, that's that's true. I've, I've never done this though, of course. Uh, I, I wrote down maybe an answer or two and then tried it a little bit, but I haven't really performed the calculation. I guess one would have some, yeah, uh, one thing I thought about maybe is to have just the, the, the nuclei fields as a background field and then um, Treat the glass as just a perturbation to this somewhat. Maybe just like just the collision of the two fields act as sources for the the for this dilute glass that is generated. But yeah, I, I never really uh, finished any calculation like this. I can at least I, I can make some. I can talk about what I would expect what would happen. Right. Um, so what we have had in these uh, simulations was pretty wide profiles with just basically a single color along Z, right? Which has smoothened out the, the 2D color charge distribution. And that means again, that along Z, it's pretty infrared. I mean, it's not because it's so uh, squeezed together, but compared to something where I have like lots of fluctuations along Z, right? Then actually things would move more towards the UV. And I would think like, if you would just perform the same calculation again, now with, uh, with these fluctuations, then I think actually this would uh, move everything more further towards boost invariance. At least that would be my expectation. So that means you have to change some other parameters to make it fit again or something like that. Of course, yeah. yeah, in that case, won't you turn on plasma instabilities when you do that? Yes, this is actually also uh, something why I was always interested in including these because um, right, so one of the things that people tried to get the glasma to isotropize was to have the 2D glasma and then add some 
fluctuations on top, right? Some some uh, random noise and see how this if, if this system is then unstable against these fluctuations and it, it takes some time, but yeah, there, there's this plasma instability, right? You get these plasma instabilities mm -hmm. that drive the system more towards isotropy. And I guess having fluctuations like that already from the nuclei would be pretty similar to this scenario. Okay, so there has been many questions and a very interesting discussion, but we have to really move to the next talk now.